quick disclaimer before we jump into this video. I want to recognize the insane amount of privilege I've had as somebody who grew up in a middle class family, went to a college of her choice, and now by some insane stroke of luck gets paid full time to make YouTube videos. There are people who work 10 times harder than me who will never be afforded the same opportunities, and frankly I feel guilty as hell for the money that I have right now, but I also want to be proud of myself and empower you guys in your own career and have an honest conversation about money, so here that is. Please don't hate me. Hello, and welcome to a video literally nobody asked me to make. I'm going to be talking about how I make that bread, as in talking about jobs, money, running a business, budgeting, getting that good good cinnamon toast crunch coin, and also literally making bread. I'm gonna make rosemary focaccia today while I talk because, I don't know, puns? So... <laughs> so bread, like any career, starts off as a little yeasty fungus that if you sew it properly, will turn into a poofy bread of financial success. I tried. So to start out our bread, I'm combining some warm water and two teaspoons of sugar in order to uh, give our yeast a nice little wake up call and say hello. This is going badly already. We're gonna let that marinate for five minutes. And in the meantime, let's talk about first jobs. So I started working right when I was 16. And I remember I was so excited. The day I turned 16, I wanted to get a job. First of all, there wasn't that much to do in my hometown. So I figured I might as well spend it working. Second of all, I played a lot of Harvest Moon and Animal Crossing growing up. So I always just saw working and like saving money as this type of game. Not in like a Wolf of Wall Street way, but just in a, I wanted to put in the work and see the numbers grow in my bank account and be able to save up money at an early age. So I worked a lot in high school. I worked at American Eagle and a local ice cream store were my first jobs. Later in high school, I also worked at The Gap at a pizza and ice cream store. I don't know why it was both pizza and ice cream. That's not really a classic combination, but that's suburban Maryland for you. And I also worked as an SAT tutor. No matter your economic situation, I would really recommend everybody work a service job at one point in their life because it just makes you a lot less of an asshole. Okay, my yeast was supposed to be foamy at this point. And oh no, I don't think I made the water warm enough. So hold on, I'm gonna redo my yeast mixture real quick. Here are my tips and what you should look for in a first job or a job that you're working while you're in school. Firstly, a job that pays tips or commissions so you can actually increase your wages by working harder. Secondly, a job that gives you the opportunity to kind of just sit around and do your homework. It's not glamorous, but if you're in school, that's the perfect way to balance having a job and having studying and homework to do. Thirdly, a job that you actually like the people in. I learned pretty early on that nearly any job is bearable if you have really fun coworkers and a chill manager. Fourthly, a job that requires minimal commute time and that also doesn't require you to get super dressed up and ready. Always consider your wages in terms of the total time that it takes you to get to work, to get ready for work. For example, if a job pays you $10 per hour, but then it takes you half an hour to drive there, half an hour to drive back, and also half an hour to get ready for a four hour shift, you're really earning much less than $10 per hour because you put in all that extra time. So it might actually be a better choice to take a job that's five minutes away from you, that's 9.50 an hour, that really doesn't require you to get dressed up, and then you're actually earning more for your time, if that makes sense. And fifthly, a job that gives you a consistent schedule and that schedules you often. This was a problem I encountered in high school when I had jobs that required me to stay available for like 20 hours per week, but only would schedule me for four to eight hours, <coughs> American Eagle. So at one point I was working four different jobs just so I could work 20 to 30 hours per week, which was so stressful. So if you can find a job that just gives you the same 20, 30 hours per week and gives you a consistent schedule, it'll give you so much more control over your life. Economic fun fact, in case you guys wanted it. This phenomenon is actually called the great risk shift, wherein over the past 50 years or so, companies have shifted the risk of fluctuating business from themselves onto their workers. For example, like back in the 50s, you would have the same 40 hour work week every single week as a store clerk. No matter how much business the store got, you were gonna get the same hours and the business would have to front the cost of being overstaffed if they weren't busy. But now nearly every business employs their workers on a fluctuating schedule. So you have to be available for like 40 hours a week. They might 
might schedule you for as little as four hours, they might schedule you up to 20 hours, and it could change every single week, which was frustrating when I was in high school, but imagine if you are like a single parent, if you are fully reliant on incomes from fluctuating jobs like that, and you need to take a bus across town, you need to book a nanny, that is insanely stressful. This is a really big problem that people need to talk about, along with, you know, raising minimum wage is also giving workers consistent schedules that they can build their life around. Okay, back to cooking, Ashley. Hope that was educational. A lot of you guys ask me how I balance school and work at the same time, and it really comes down to managing your time effectively. This is my actual planner from high school. As you can tell, I kind of had a lot of pent up aggression that I needed to like take out on scribbling out text in my planner, but all my homework assignments were in black, all my due dates were in red, and then all of my work shifts from my various jobs were in purple. Having a planner is like the most basic strategy for organizing your life, but it really did help me keep track of all the craziness that was going on. I would do my homework on the bus, on my way to work. I would do them at my jobs when they allowed it. Even at jobs that technically didn't allow me to do homework, I would get a napkin and I would write out all of my like study terms, key vocabulary, and I would just like from memory study all of my courses while I was at work. And nobody ever caught me for that because they just thought I was like doodling on a napkin when in reality, I was getting shit done. But also remember, it is all about balance. At the end of the day, you're only in high school or college once. You really have to give yourself the time to get the good grades, to get the quality education that you're paying for. I don't know, to just like enjoy being young, I guess. I sound like such an old person. I'm 21, but like, enjoy school while it lasts, kids. Because once you're graduated, I don't know what the fuck is happening. <laughs> Time to bust out the Costco sized olive oil. We're gonna get one quarter cup of that. Oh, okay. While I am stirring up this dough baby, let's talk about some side hustles. Uh, side hustle is such a cringy word, um, but I have liked kind of selling things on the side. Not drugs. I guess technically the first way that I earned money was crocheting little stuffed animals and then I would sell them at my local like art gallery. <laughs> they had a little gift shop, they took a 30% cut and then I'd earn like $10 per little crochet animal. I also sold art prints on Etsy for a while. In retrospect, I had a bit of a weird business model because I did charcoal drawings of celebrities. Why does somebody need my drawing of Beyonce like in their room? I'm not really sure, but I, I sold a couple of those. There was this very kind lady from Minnesota who hired me to draw her children for her. So I did like portraiture for a while. The summer after my senior year in high school, I started a company called Chokers and company. Yes, I know that sounds like a dominatrix thing, but it was literally just me selling handmade velvet chokers. I sold them on Poshmark and Depop, which are both reselling apps. And I also sold them on Etsy. And yeah, I earned like a thousand dollars that summer just selling chokers, which I remember being very, very proud of. Oh, another one is thrifting and reselling clothing. I started, I think when I was 16, just reselling my used clothing on Poshmark. And that evolved a couple years down the line into me thrifting clothing or sewing and altering clothing and then selling that. And that's still something that I do to this day. I have a little website. None of those businesses ever made me like richy rich. They never made me a ton of money, but it was a really good way to earn some extra money on the side. And it also taught me a lot of the basics of running a business, like how to market, how to keep inventory, how to turn around all of my product in a certain amount of time and ship it out. There's also just something great about working for yourself and being able to build something for yourself and like who knows if you start a little small business now it could be your full-time job in a couple years all right here is how our dough is looking it's a nice little sticky dough baby so i'm gonna take it out of the bowl apparently you're supposed to shape this into a ball okay i think we need a little more flour okay you're supposed to grease the bowl with some olive oil and then we're gonna pop our baby back in the bowl. Let the dough rest for 45 to 60 minutes in a warm place until the dough has nearly doubled in size. I'm gonna put this near my heater so it gets nice and toasty, but I'll be right back. And now we have 45 minutes to talk, so. You call yourself a free spirit. I worked as a freelance videographer and photographer throughout my college years. My number one tip for freelancing, know how much you are worth. I feel like this is advice that everybody gives, but it was never something that I took to heart because I was always like, oh, I'm young, I'm a film student, especially as somebody who had worked for minimum wage for so long. I always framed it in terms of, I like freelancing. I work for minimum wage. Therefore, when I freelance, I should be paid approximately minimum wage or less because it's something I enjoy. And honestly, that works to get your foot in the door. But at a certain point, you have to really assert how much you know that you're worth. For example, my first gig when I was in college, I charged $400 to shoot, direct, and edit two 
full music videos. In my 18 year old brain, I was like, I'm making bank and I get to direct a music video. That's so cool. But at the same time, I put probably like 80 hours of work into those projects. So I was earning $5 an hour, but I should at least have been paying myself like 10, $15 an hour. And in retrospect, the guy would have paid me a lot more, but I just asked for $400 and he was like, yeah, that's cool. When I started working for the Sorry Girls, they asked me what my rate per video was, and I said $150 to edit one video. It took me a couple months to work up the courage to ask them for a raise. Now, this was the first raise I had ever asked for in my life, and I was fucking terrified. They didn't give me the full amount that I asked for, but they did raise me to $225. And just in one email, I was earning $75 more per video. And all I had to do was ask for it. Later, I got dinner with them and they said, hey, Ashley, we know that you asked for this raise a couple months ago. You've been doing a really good job. We will pay you the full amount that you asked for. So that was a huge lesson for me in not being afraid to ask for a little bit more and realizing like, hey, I, I do have skills that are worth money to people. That summer, I got an email from an interior designer in Seattle who had watched my YouTube videos. And she said she really liked my editing style and she wanted to know if I could edit a home tour for her. Once I edited that video, she actually liked it so much that she flew me up to Seattle. She paid me $100 an hour to shoot videos for her. And then I had like five more videos to edit for her for that same rate. So it turned out really well she was happy with the services and I was really happy with my rate for once <laughs> this is to say obviously do not go out as like an amateur and charge like five times the going rate for wedding photography or something like that know your skills but also know that once you develop that skill set people are willing to pay for it the last thing for freelancing that also helped me out was having my own website I designed one on Squarespace this is not sponsored by them but I did a little portfolio website so that I had something that looked really professional to direct people to and be like oh she knows what she's doing 45 minutes later, our bread is looking nice and healthy and well fed. I'm gonna flour a baking sheet and shape the dough. Throw back to my days working at a pizza shop in high school. My favorite part of that job was always being the dough girl. And I would just like shape pizza dough for five hours at a time. And it was actually really therapeutic and cheaper than therapy. So at this point we pretty much reached my current part of my financial story, which is now I work full time on YouTube. Right now I have a couple different revenue streams. AdSense is my main one. That's the ads that run before my videos. AdSense is around 50% of my total revenue pie, if you will. Another 20% or so is affiliate links. Those are the links that are in the description of my video. So when you guys watch an outfit video and you're interested in buying the piece of clothing, if you click on my links, I'll earn like one to 3% of the final sale. So thank you guys for clicking on my links. I really appreciate it. And then the remaining 30% or so of my income comes from sponsorships. You guys have seen sponsorships, you know what they are. Basically a brand is like, hey, we wanna make you <laughs> talk about us in your video. And then I talk about them in my video. By the way, this is covered in plastic wrap now. It's gonna rise for another 20 minutes. So it gets extra floofy and the yeast has more time to, uh, to do its thing. I forget the science behind all of this. Speaking of sponsorships though, I am actually going to take a break from YouTube sponsorships. I'm not gonna do any this entire summer. I'm gonna see how it goes. I've always just hated and I feel so guilty putting an ad in a video. You guys have done so much to support me. And then I'm gonna take another two minutes out of your day to talk about a product, even if it's something that I really love and I think you guys should use. I, I don't want to lose the trust between me and you. I don't wanna lose like the honesty that's there and the creative freedom that I have. And I feel like I've been giving that up to brands. You know, to be honest, like brand rates are fucking dank. I could be making bank right now, but I don't, want to if it comes at that cost. In nearly every other career, earning more money is associated with doing a better job. Like if you're working really hard as, I don't know, like an engineer, you get a raise because you did a good job and you help people out. But as a YouTuber, if I do take sponsorships, I'm earning more money, not because I'm a better person, but because I'm more of a sellout, you know? Because I like sold more of your guys' attention to a company rather than like really pushing myself to make better videos. I want to earn money in a way that I'm proud of. I am constantly nervous that my like time on, on YouTube and on social media will burn out and people won't like me anymore. And you know, that'll probably happen one day and I can't prevent it. But the thing that I can do is not selling out while I have the chance and while I have your guys' attention and your trust and a platform to say things, I want to be able to say exactly what I want to say and not anybody else's message, you know? Yeah, it's gonna be a really exciting summer. No more YouTube sponsorships. You can click on every video knowing that it's just me and all of my own opinions, um, which is really, really exciting to say. 
welfare questions that I've got about YouTuber stuff. Um, I do have a manager, his name is Alex, and he takes a 20% cut of my brand deals. Having a manager on YouTube doesn't mean that you have somebody like telling you what videos to make and controlling your content. It's really just somebody that you work alongside. And now going forward, Alex is putting less of his focus on brand deals and more focus on bigger, longer term projects that are like actually exciting and not like 15 HelloFresh deals. I also have an accountant who I pay around $230 per month and he takes care of all of my bookkeeping. Regardless of whether you're a YouTuber or not, if you're self-employed, it's a great idea to incorporate. Massively helpful for bookkeeping and tax season. You know what is a business expense because you have a separate business account, a separate business card, and what is a personal expense. And therefore, at the end of the year, you know what the taxable profit from your company is. So yeah, that's shit that they never teach you in school, but they really should because I had to figure it out all by myself. I'm gonna poke little holes throughout the dough because uh, I, I don't know, this is just how focaccia works apparently. And since it's rosemary focaccia, I got some rosemary sprigs. I'm gonna put a little sprigaroni in each of the holes. This is not the ideal cooking angle, I'm quickly realizing. about budgeting, shall we? Like the complete and utter data freak that I am, I have been tracking my expenses since I was 16 years old. I personally love, just for the joy of data, being able to look back at my budget and how much that I spent. But on the practical end, it's also just great to know how much you're spending in each optional category, how much your set expenses are, so you can track which categories you wanna save money in, which ones to you are worth spending more in, and how you can save up for bigger goals, like large purchases, paying off debt, Etc. At this point in my life, I don't set strict limits for each category, but I more so use my budget as a way to keep myself accountable. Especially as our society becomes more and more cashless, it can honestly not even feel like you're spending money when you just like type in a couple numbers online or swipe a little plastic card. So I like writing down all of my expenses in my budget just to hold myself accountable. Since I do have all the numbers, I thought I'd just give you guys a straight up snapshot of how much money I spend in a month. Please don't judge me for this, but I thought it'd be interesting because not that many people are actually transparent about the money that they spend and it might be an interesting snapshot into what a 21 year old living in LA spends. I live in a studio and I pay $1,650 for rent. Wi-Fi and electricity is around $65 per month and car insurance is $150 per month because LA drivers are motherfucking crazy. I spent $313.31 on food this is a little bit higher than usual. Normally I try to keep my food budget around $200, but it has been creeping up a little bit recently because I live near Whole Foods. And once you taste a Whole Foods strawberry, you're never going back. So typically my set expenses run me around $2,100 per month. In terms of discretionary expenses, I spent $87 on entertainment. I really don't go out to drink or to events, but I did buy two concert tickets. $78 on makeup and skincare, and $328 on clothing because it's my job and also I love it, so please don't hate me. I spent $182.35 on decor. I recently, well, kind of recently, a couple months ago I moved into this apartment, so I'm still buying some materials and decor for my apartment, and $26 on miscellaneous pens and candles and random shit. So total last month I spent $2,880, which I'd say is pretty typical. My mentality when it comes to spending money has always been that money should be a means to reduce your stress, to make your life easier, to make you happier, and it should never be the other way around. Which seems obvious when you say it, but I think a lot of people buy a fancy car with a lease that's gonna stress them out every single month. They get into credit card debt, buying fancy clothes that they just got to like flex on people. I don't know. If making a discretionary purchase is gonna stress you out, put you in debt, make you worried whether you can pay rent the next month, never worth it. Oh. The bread is ready. It's ready. <laughs> Here she is. Oh, look at her. She's so handsome. I feel so proud of this bread. Let's dive in. Hmm. That concludes this video. I'm gonna go and elope with this bread now because it's fucking delicious. More like a loaf with this bread. I'm, I'm way too proud of that one. I'm sorry.